uh, our first speaker is from Sweden, where he actually likes the fact that the government takes high taxes from him. Because the government uses this money wisely. They, they're very smart about how they use the money. Again, as opposed to the country I come from, where they use the money to build bombs and kill people. All right? So I'm very excited and proud to introduce Hans, you ready? the director of the Gap Minder Foundation, Hans Rosling. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to talk about the global digital landscape in a very simple down-to-earth way. If you invite a 61-year-old professor in public health, this is what you get. Huh? Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the global landscape, so we can see a little where the, how the diggle comes in. And let me start here, in 1950. Very straightforward with Indonesia and the Netherlands. On this axis down here, I have the size of family. Indonesia had more than five children per woman. The Netherlands had two children per woman. In uh, please take away that image. I'm not beautiful. Show my graphs. Uh, it has unfortunately cut the name of this axis. It is life expectancy at birth. How long you live? In Netherlands, you had small families and long life. In Indonesia, they had large families and short life. And what has happened? Look at the world, how it's changing. Netherlands started to give some decent aid to Indonesia. And they started to put children in school. They trained health staff. They built their country. They invested in infrastructure. They got better water and hygiene. They got independent. They moved into the world. They grow their market. They started to export and see how nicely they are catching up. Be very be careful there, here they come. Eh? <laughs> it's quite interesting. Today, Indonesia, oh, this is the projection for next year, 2010, but they have more or less the same family size as the Netherlands had 1972. That's where they are. They have catched up in the bedroom, best of all. Because what is this axis? This is the bedroom, where there is male patriarchal sexuality and you get as many kids as you get, or whether it's the young couple with pillow talks who says we shall have two children with shoes. They shall have a guitar and a football, and once the family shall go to the beach. That's modern family. That's what Indonesia is today. Huh? And, and, and so they have planning there. And this, this axis, life expectancy, it's just the bathroom and the kitchen. If you have water, soap, and food on the table, you live 65 years. Then health service come and add another 10 years and make life a little nicer. Huh? But basically you can see that in health service, Indonesia has only catched up, so they are like when Netherlands were 1950. So they are one generation behind in the bedroom, they are two generations behind in the bathroom and the kitchen. And now let's look at their paycheck. I'll swap this axis over to, to uh, GDP per capita. And when we change to GDP per capita, they're way behind. They're way behind. They're almost the same relation in the, in the bedroom. They're a little more behind when it comes to the general life condition, and that is because the paycheck is so small. Look how far I have to take the Netherlands back to find the same economy as Indonesia today. Well, we, go, we can go to those terrible years of 1944-1945, that terrible winter when the Netherlands were suffering so much in the end of the war and had a life expectancy of 55 only. Eh? But otherwise, in the peaceful Netherlands, we have to go back to somewhere 1877. Isn't it amazing what Asia is today? They've catched up in human resources. They share the modern vision of families, but they are not rich yet. That's why they work so hard, that's why they are so entrepreneurial, that's why their economy is growing so fast in Indonesia, even more in China, even more in India. Asia is catching up. Now, I could take away this and I could show the whole world. Look, this is the whole world. United States over there, riches but not so healthy. They only have 78 years of life expectancy comparable to countries like Chile and Costa Rica. And, and, and Japan is the healthiest of all up there. But then we have countries all the way down here. 
and there's a continuous world, and the continuous world is converging. But the last billion is not there. So this is my sort of background for the digital landscape. But I would like to go, since it was commercial, let me show you money much clearly. This axis here shows dollar per person. And this is the distribution of the population of the world. This is Africa. Africa, half the population live below one dollar, which is the limit by, at which you go to bed hungry. Eh? And this is the OECD countries, and ten dollars is the limit where you have welfare. You can send your kids to the school they need, you can get the health service the family needs, more or less. Eh? So you can see some are below this in OECD, a lot of people in Africa are above hunger and even reaching the welfare level. Now, this is Latin America, it's a green anaconda covering all countries. This is East Europe, also very big distribution. And this is East Asia and this is South Asia. Those numbers are household incomes, it's not national account. It shows the distribution within the households. And we can move on and see how the world was when I was a young student. I was a young student in 1972, and I did public health in Bangalore, St. John's Medical College in southern India. And then, you know, poverty was in South Asia, East Asia, and so on. But this is what has happened. See how the economy has grown, the population has grown, and billions of people have got out of poverty, but they haven't reached welfare. Most of the world population, the emerging economies, are between $1 to $10 a day. And then there is one billion below one dollar, and there is about one to two billion allow, uh, above this. So the sort of, the sort of uh, mindsets we used to have was the G7 mindset. That there was a Western world, and there was a developing world. And this had long life in small family and short life in large family. That is no longer. Uh, this is what the Swedish media elite thinks. Look, I run the same stuff for them. Uh, yes, that we are developing a game, I couldn't bring it here, it was the first prototype where we let the media elite in Stockholm guess where Iran was. And these, these dots here are the guesses where Iran was in number of children per woman and life expectancy, and Iran is there. Iran may have a leader that many of us don't like. Eh? But the people of Iran is highly trained, it has changed tremendously and are very industrial and highly educated. And it, the media elite in Sweden are more or less 25 years to 30 years behind reality. In fact, Swedish students have the view of the world that correspond to reality the year their teachers were born. This is, this is really a problem for West Europe and North America when we deal with the world, that we have not understand the enormous catch-up that is taking place. So we need a new mindset. And at this place, I would like to honor George W. Bush, because I heard that he was criticized earlier on from stage here. And you have to think very carefully to honor George W. Bush, but he can be honored for one thing, and I think that is what he will be remembered for. When Lehman Brothers went down, when the economic crisis came, he tried to raise money from Britain, from Europe, from Japan, and they all said, we in G7, we have no money. We are like this, this is G7. Uh, we have no money. So they phoned a socialist trade union leader, Lula, in Brazil, and asked him, do you have money? Yeah, I have money, we save these days. I can help you, but I want to sit in the board of IMF, International Monetary Fund, not just come to drink coffee in Washington. That's exactly what he said. And then they phoned Putin, and Putin said, yeah, I have money these days, he said, you know. And they phoned Saudi Arabia, we always have money. And then they phoned China, and they say, we have most money of all. So today, it's the middle-income countries, the emerging economy that has the money. They are saving. Today, the risk and wastefulness is in the high-income countries. And then Bush did this glorious thing, he said, to hell with G7. They are broke, let's convene the first meeting of the G20. That's a historical event. And maybe 50 to 100 years from now, that's what he will be remembered for. That was the, the Western concept, the concept of NATO governing the world was given up. And, and we have this new idea. We have a bottom billion, the really poor people, where we are discussing how the aid should work. We have the emerging markets in the middle, and we have the West plus 
Japan and the Gulf and so on that end. Now, how is the digital landscape upon this? Let me try to see if the internet is working. This morning it worked quite nicely until you came and started your laptops. Uh, first, electricity. Income per person here from $400, $4,000, $40,000. This is 1972, inflation adjusting purchasing power dollars. And, and this is electrical power because all this digital landscape in the end needs electricity, isn't it? And we all love electricity, isn't it? You all use washing machines. Is there anyone here hand washing sheets and, and trousers? I will check when I travel. No. So everyone wants washing machines. So that's the target for the world population. We want washing machines. Look here how very closely related electrical power consumption, kilowatt per hour, is to the money. It goes from 40 kilowatt hours to 400 to 4,000. Linear relation on a logarithmic scale. The richer we get, the more electricity we consume. Everyone loves electricity. Some has very energy-consuming industries like Sweden uh, and Norway, and they are wasteful. Some are a little more careful. See how nice it is with graphics? I know the countries. That's why you should put statistics in graphics. How many cell phone numbers do you remember? How many faces do you remember? We have to animate, we have to put things in, into image much more if we want to use data effectively in the digital landscape. So here we go. We run this, what has happened with electricity, and it works. It's over the net here. And you can see when countries get richer, they use more and more electricity. And still some countries down here, Ethiopia and Congo, are in death desperate electricity deficiency. Perhaps electricity deficiency is one of the worst diseases in the world. The lack of electricity is as risky for a family as the lack of vaccination of the children. Just one light bulb in the home enables you to clean up when the child vomit or have diarrhea in the night. And it enables the family to work in the evening, to listen to the radio program, to charge their, cell, their mobile telephone when that time comes. Electricity is a blessing for mankind. Yeah? And, and uh, how has it then been turned over and used to, uh, to have um, looked at internet? Shall we start with the internet, perhaps? Yeah? And I would then go back some years here. I'll see if the net would work, and I go to uh, technology, communication, uh, internet users per 100 people. Internet users per 100 people is loading there, and it doesn't make sense to have logarithm. This was 1990, there was no internet. Everyone was down there, eh? and then this happened. See how beautiful? It was not countries getting richer. It was just internet appearing. It was a new technology, not like electricity, you know. They went from the bottom just up like this. But internet hardly does not exist below $10,000, and it's almost gone down here. Very, very few users. Some call it a digital divide, but it's really completely different how we can work. You can see countries like Peru here, Morocco, Colombia, 15, 20% have regular use of, of the internet. Now, a big difference from that is if we would look instead at the cell phone. I would go to technology, I would go to communication, and I ask cell phone per 100 people. Come on, load, load. E, it should have been linear there. You see, li cell phone is nicer. Cell phone is rising much more rapidly. It's 49%. It's so many cell phones per person. So some countries here, Lithuania has 138 cell phones per 100 persons. Ah, many of you have two cell phones. You have the private one and you have the company one. We are already above one cell phone per person. And that's Lithuania. The Baltic countries were very fast in, in innovating their, their telephone industry. We have Ukraine is high there. We have Tunisia already on 70%. Cell phone is completely different from internet because it has penetrated so much. And at this point, you know, the convergence of the world 
is taking place in cell phone. And I have to show more Ibrahim. It's one of my heroes. The real entrepreneur who started Celtel. He's a Sudanese entrepreneur who worked for, uh, for telephone companies in Britain and then started his, his, his own company, which has now gone all over Africa. And he managed to have prepaid use of telephones, was the crucial things. And he managed to penetrate in a way that no one understood. There was no aid money in this. It was the technology and the need of the people itself that made it work. And, and in fact now, he has sold it and it's now run under SANE. SANE is the name of the company. Isn't that map wonderful? How you can build a three billion worth company in those countries, Congo. That's where you used to see the crisis in the world are. Those are the terrible, nasty things where they are war. He penetrated cell phones through the wars and, and all over these some of the very, very poorest companies, uh, no, some of the very poorest countries in Africa here, he has managed to grow this uh, company. Then he left it, he thought others should take over, he created Mo Ibrahim Foundation, where he gives a very nice grant every year to an uh, honorable African political leader that resigns democratically after have done good in his country. Mozambique's president won Botswana, we think Ghana's is next. It's fantastic, isn't it? He grew the company in Africa's poorest countries, and he makes a Rockefeller Foundation-like creation and give the money back to that place. And he was trained in Alexandria in, in, uh, in Egypt. So this is what we, what we can see in, um, in, in the digital landscape happening. And what does it mean, the cell phone, in the poorest part? This is one woman who has a little shop and she also has a cell phone there. It's a village cell phone that makes the difference in the poorest part of the world today. It completely changed the, the, the digital landscape, the communication landscape. That you go to the little shop and then you can send a text message to your cousin, which you have in the capital, and you can tell him, oh, oh my child is sick, I need money to buy antibiotics. And then he can send airtime back to this little kiosk and she will pay money. It's an instant banking service out in rural villages, not only in, in this is Asia, but also in Africa. And it provides even working opportunity for a disabled man in a very poor African, African uh, village. And, and the cell phone, he, he proudly managed the cell phone down here. This is the tip of the digital landscape of the world today. This is how far it has gone. And people operating in these areas, the, the young entrepreneurs, I worked for a time with Google, Google's philanthropic arm, and, and we did an investigation which was, came up with a number of surprising findings of, of the digital landscape in the poorest countries in Africa. People said, if I have just a few words to say, I'll phone. If I have a lot to say, I'll text. We do the other way around, isn't it? because it's too costly to phone. Texting is almost without cost. The cell phone companies recover too much money on the texting. We could provide texting devices for all people of the world within five years, because it's so cheap to run them. And, and, and it's just the coverage in the most scarce, sparsely populated area, which is difficult. Now, <clears throat> what happens with this? It means that someone gets sick in the family, you can transfer money. Someone who runs a business, a carpenter in this village, he wants, <clears throat> normally he would go to the sawmill with a normal bus, <clears throat> he would buy the sort of uh, wood he needed, he would wait for a lorry to come, and then try to get his stuff onto that lorry, and then go back, it would take him a week. Now he can coordinate all that by texting. And normally he would only phone to make the deal with the lorry driver. And he could, in two days, he would do what he did in five days before. But many in the richer part of the world, in the high income countries, they think that cell phones would be used for information. It's not in the poorest part, it's used for communication. It makes life much more efficient for people and they can, they can communicate in a better way. And that's, that's what, we, what we are seeing happening with the digital landscape out in the poorest countries of the world. And thereby, we hope 
that this will, in, uh, in contrast to the internet, which is not reaching out. We were quite shy. I was with the Google team. I, we went to Uganda, the Uganda Bureau of Statistics that has a nice investment. They can't reach Google spreadsheet. It's too demanding. Yeah? They can't reach Google Maps. But the cell phones up in northern Uganda here, they can do it. So if we start to try to predict where things may be happening, we can look at the world in this way. We have GDP per capita here. We have child survival on this axis. This is Africa. This is Asia, uh, South Asia, East Asia, Arab world, uh, East Europe, Latin America, and the OECD countries. And when I split them like this, you can see the difference within Africa. You can see the difference within Asia. And you can see the difference within Arab countries. You can see the difference here in East Europe and the difference in Latin America and the difference in the OECD countries, and this is the world. We have conflicts down in countries like Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh was there. This is Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, Norway, our neighboring country, which is very generous with developing aid, are putting a lot of developing aid for the poor people in Bangladesh. Uh, at the same time, Telenor is running a very profitable business in, Bang in Bangladesh. And the Norwegian people got completely confused. This is not right. In one way, we give money to the people of Bangladesh because they are poor, and in another way, we earn money on them, which we then give back, they thought. It didn't fit in the G7 mindset. But I think it's good. I think it's very good if Norway helped the last groups of poor people in Bangladesh to get to school to get health service at the same time as a company invests in Bangladesh, put a modern technology and business there which is profitable, which doesn't need any subsidies at all. The only problem was that they hired young children to go up the mosque to clean them. But they realized that and they acted very frankly and they said we were bad in that, we shouldn't have child labor in doing that. And that was corrected. So what we can see is that the cell phone is the real changer of the digital landscape down here. It's quite, quite dramatic what we can see happening. And, <clears throat> and the most important thing is that it helps people do business. It helps people to borrow money within their social networks. And, and uh, we can hope even that when we look at how poor these countries are, I will take, for instance, let me take Uganda, which I talked about. I split Uganda here in the richest 20% are up there. Now, they are all can be internet users, but the poorest 20% of Uganda are down here. And I could go to Niger in West Africa. Then you are out there with the poorest people. Now, the cell phone is used in Niger, and there's a very interesting way. The, the serial traders use cell phones to find out the market. It makes the market much more efficient because they can find the prices. People who have been trading in cereals and have been analphabets, illiterate, are now learning to read on the cell phone. It's adult literacy campaign on the cell phone. It's quite amazing. And they learn block reading word by word. And then later on they start to grasp, grasp, grasp the, the letters. It's an absolutely interesting when you have that technology. There's only two technologies I've seen done doing the same. It's the ball pen and the plastic bag. The ball pen and the plastic bag has penetrated all the way down to the poor people. And the plastic bag is fantastic. You all have plastic bags at home. But if you just have one, you use it to put water in, and you make a little hole, and then you wash yourself under it. And it makes the use of water in the family, which you have carried, much more efficient. The ball pen can write five times longer lines than a pencil. And it's much more productive when your kids go to school. And now the cell phone is coming in and providing it. It's really interesting. And you have to get to know this. We have to provide a sort of evidence-based view of the world where we can uh, see what services will work and what will not work. Internet will not go down to the poorest, it will be late. If you want to reach out in the world, you go with a cell phone. Huh? And you have application on that. And it's the text application, it's not the talking which will work. And, and then we can provide 
uh, information on the net in the richer part of the world, trying to have them to understand. Well, probably have, have uh, harsh competition from middle-income countries. Ericsson is uh, realizing now that Cisco is not the competitor for the base station any longer. It is the Chinese who are the main competitors. Huh? And, <clears throat> and we are running, I'm running Gapminder Foundation on the net, where you can go and you can check up. I will, I will end at this point. You can, you can uh, uh, see all the presentation I used, all the animation, the statistic, you can see at this web page. And we are very hopeful of getting away the ignorance of, of uh, the high-income countries, not understanding the world. Many tell me that that won't happen. People just go for nasty things to the internet anyhow. It doesn't work. But I'll prove you the difference. You know. If you go to look for sex, or money, or health. I mean, this is something people, people very often look for, isn't it? Yeah? What do you get? Do you get rubbish or do you get something important? You get Swedish public health on top of 100 million hits on sex, money, and health. Come and look at it. Thank you very much. Sex, money, and health. All right. Um, I, I want to, I've got a lot of things I want to ask you. I know we won't have enough time. Uh, the G20, what language did they talk at that conference? What language did they use? I think they will use English, and the English. biggest English-speaking country in the world is India. Right. And the right. shining India will also be the biggest country in the world. It will be home of the Eng English language. Right, because I, I can tell you, as I have done my own outsourcing uh, to hire programmers, uh, we are using programmers in India because they can speak English, yeah. right? So, what do you think about that? Do you feel good? Bad? As a Swedish person, uh, you speak articulate English, but Swedish is your home language. How, what do you feel about that? <clears throat> we, we are proud of speaking English, at least in this way we do it. And, and uh, this is very natural that we will do it. I think it was Bismarck who was asked, what is the most important political trend in the world? And he said, it's that the United States of America speaks English. And if this is really long term what it is. We, we used to, I mean, we've never spoken Swedish seriously. You know, it's only when we were the Al-Qaeda of Northern Europe, you know, and we used to harass the other people, you know. We never had the, the Romans there, you know. And, and then after that we spoke Latin, and then after that we spoke French, and then we started to speak German, and then after Stalingrad we swapped. Actually, we wrote our thesis in German until Stalingrad at my university, and after Stalingrad we rapidly swapped to English. We were very adaptive. My youngest child went to Beijing and he speaks Chinese fluently, so okay, all right, we've so secured that. Alternative. Um, now, also, you you use a technology uh, which is very dear to my heart, which is computer graphics. Yeah. And you talked about visualizing data and understanding things and, and visualizing. And as we've watched the evolution of computer graphics, more or less in parallel to mobile technology, uh, whether it's video games or special effects in movies, uh, virtual reality, we're seeing the growth and spreading of computer graphics, and NVIDIA, for instance, is putting these chips now into the mobile phones. So do you think that this, uh, the power of visualization can jump over into the mobile phones as well? Yeah, they can. I, I, I'm addicted to the Sudoku game that I got from, from App Store free here, that, that what I spend half my, my free time on now, and I have this time, how fast I can solve the easy Sudoku, because I get uh, timing on my Sudoku solving of this, and this I really like, you know. Right. So instead of doing the difficult one in the newspaper, I try to, I'm three, 341 now I have on the easy one. <laughs> I, we will be doing a but Sudoku then, well, contest think, later. You, you said that we did graphics. We did animation. A lot of people are very skilled at doing graphics digital for the printing media. But now after Flash, we can animate. And I'm old enough, you know, to have enjoyed Donald Duck cartoons before I saw the movies. I was eight years old when I saw the first Donald Duck animated movie, it blow away my head, you know, this is the future, this is fun, you know. It's animation. When I show this Babel movie, I showed Indonesia catch up with you. It wouldn't have given that impression if I would have shown two static graphics. Uh, 
Uh, and showing time as animation. And, and that's why computer game is so fun. It's animated in time. And it's not graphic, it's animation, which is... And that hasn't moved into TV. Have you realized that? TV use, TV use almost animation for three things. First is branding. BBC, World News, big animation, World News, and then come the news and no animations. It's only when they start a new war, Battlefield Iraq, then, you know, the generals came in and made funny animations, you know. Boys have always played with the soldiers and tried to animate them like that. And then it's presidential election, but they are quite stupid when they try to overdo it with boy toys in CNN, you know, that doesn't make sense. We, animation is still so costly to do, because you have to invent and you have to design the movement, and movement is very difficult to design. And how you make your rhetoric understandable in this side. You saw when I splitted those bubbles, you know. And that bubble is not just splitting it, it has to land beautifully. So we have too few graphical animators in the IT. I really think it's a future. And we have to find more generic formats so we can cut the cost. Uh, and this is what I'm going to discuss at lunch here with the media people. How can we cut the cost of animation so we can use them in the TV media? Okay, finally, uh, last point. Um, <clears throat> so the histor historical, the past 50, 80 years of the U.S. has been uh, the president has his finger over the, the button of the bomb. And this threat that the U.S. can put over everybody uh, is a key part of their power. Our new president has figured out how to put his finger on the button of the printing press so he can print up money. And by printing up all this money, they're attempting to solve the problems of the world. Okay? And obviously, the bankers, the insurance companies, Wall Street, these are how these problems were created with greed because they are spending their time not producing anything. It's all air. It's not products. Now, I as a supporter of Obama, I say, that's great. Print up as much money as you can. But it's obvious that he has made a deal with Wall Street to say, look, I'm going to print up all this money, but do not deflate our economies. Keep it high. We will create all this debt. This will maybe solve, make up for the greed that you, Wall Street, have created on us. Okay? What do you think of this notion of just printing up more and more money to create this huge amount of debt, $10 trillion of debt, uh, do you think this will solve the problems? The Chinese president was asked by the media in the last Davos meeting if he had any advice to the new US president. And he said, yes, be kind to those that borrow you money. Because he's not printing money, he's borrowing. He's borrowing money because the China is accumulating every day for the last five years, one billion US dollar a day. Bill and Melinda Gates, generously, and in a reasonable, good way. Uh, it's painful for a Swedish pro public health professor, normal doesn't say nice things about American bi billionaires, but they did it well, they did it well. Uh, how much do they give? Three billion US dollar a day. That's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in China. That's three days accumulation. The whole Iraq war, the, the economic cost for the taxpayer of the US corresponds to little more than two months of accumulation in China. They can run four wars like that without going into a debt. You run one war and you are deep in the shit. <laughs> because you are borrowing money. So to me, the problem is not really the politicians in the United States, it's the people. The people have most access to information ever in history, and they have the notion that they can live in a way which is superior to the rest of the world. That's very risky. We have to avoid the war between the United States and China. This is the most important, to avoid yet, that war. But, but yet, Americans, they will spend all that money on the war, but then when we talk about health, I come from a state, California, where 25% of the people have no health coverage. And so when we say, well, let's spend some money to have universal health, the coverage, all of a sudden, the, the, some Americans will resist this, but yet they would love to blow up bombs and, and kill people. So th this is the dichotomy I see that's going on. But as long as China will buy the paper, I guess it's okay, right? <laughs> it's very risky. It's very unbalanced, the world. The world is extremely unbalanced at present, you know. And to me, people ask me, do you reach the power people? Yeah, I've, I've talked to the head of state. I've talked to the State Department in Washington. I've talked to all the billionaires. That's not the thing. The thing is to reach the public. 
the ordinary people that must understand how the world is. And, and, and I think the mayor of Rotterdam is a person I also like very much, who in the different immigration landscape of, of the Netherlands tried to find a middle way. Uh, so so this, this is extremely important. The notion of being superior of the Western world, how to adapt in a world of equals, because that's what's going to happen in the next, in the next 50 years. It was wonderful what happens in the Netherlands when you started the banking system from Erasmus and all the way forward. You know. This nation is really great, you know. but you got this idea that you are super, superior. It won't work. I say Sweden have done one thing the last 10 years, which is important, you know. And the only thing that, the, the, what's the governor in California now? Uh, Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger. Our prime minister went to see Schwarzenegger. He knew only one thing about Sweden, the ice hotel. We did an ice hotel. It's tourism. Bloody sake, West Europe will be tourism in the future. It started in Venice. Venice is tourism today. The Asians and the others will come here to see where it all started. Prepare the museums, you know, and welcome the tourists. You're a little too squeezed. Sweden have a lot of places. I try to argue that we should, should prepare for that. The world will change, you know, and the digital landscape, the cell phone technology is pushing it faster, eh? and it will be taken up. And the Americans, they just have to understand. They just have to understand how the world is. I think most people understand sex and drugs, and so at least they go to Amsterdam. So, all right, thank you very thank much. Thank you. All right. All right, we're going to come back in 15 minutes. <laughs>